Awesome. Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome to our webinar for the day. Uh, my name is Heather Grant. I am one of the maintenance community admins here at the maintenance community by Upkeep. Um, thank you for making time to be with us today. If you are not already a member of the maintenance community on Slack, we would love to have you join us. I will drop the sign up link in the chat in just a moment. Today, we have Tom Moriarty joining for a presentation on making process changes permanent. I will let him introduce himself in just a moment, but I know we're in for a great presentation. The recording from our session today will be available at this link right after we end, as well as in the maintenance community on Slack tomorrow, along with a copy of the slides. Tom is also available to answer any questions live in the Slack group, so please feel free to share the recording of this webinar or the invitation to Slack with friends, colleagues, or anyone else you know who would benefit from hearing some of Tom's expertise. My last piece of housekeeping, and then we'll go ahead and get started. You'll notice that your cameras and microphones are not turned on today. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to chat your questions as they come up throughout the presentation, as I said, um, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of our time today. Anything we don't get to uh, during our, our next hour, 57 minutes, we will um, answer offline in the community as well. So that is it from me. Thank you once again, everyone, for being here, Tom especially. Thanks for making the time today. And I will turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, so uh, before I get rolling, I just wanted to uh, make a, a personal uh, announcement about um, Leah Freeberg. Uh, she was a, a wonderful person uh, in our industry, and uh, we got word last week that she um, she passed away in a car accident. Um, so any of you that know her, um, she was a wonderful person, connected a lot of people in our industry, um, was always looking out for everybody's best interests. She was a a tremendous person. So uh, please keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Her her family, uh, she leaves behind some children and a husband. Um, very devastating loss for our community. Um, so with that note aside, um, I want to thank you be, for being here today. And uh, this is making process changes permanent. And when I talk about processes, this could be anything from an entire organization uh, change management effort going into Lean or Six Sigma or something like that. Or it could be if you're uh, simply a, a work center supervisor and you're trying to initiate, uh, you know, a, a tool uh, checkout process or procedure. So when I say process changes, it could be any sort of activity that we're trying to make permanent. Um, when we talk about culture change, we'll, we'll talk about what uh, that involves here in just a moment. So um, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but uh, if you go back and read or, or view the recording of this session, you can go into a lot more detail, but I'll just say I'm a uh, retired Coast Guard officer. Uh, I had 24 years of service. Uh, I uh, started consulting in uh, 2003 after I retired. So I've got uh, nearly 20 years uh, in the consulting industry. Uh, I have a uh, professional master of business administration with a focus in organizational development, bachelor of mechanical engineering, um, CMRP, and uh, certified asset reliability practitioner. Um, author of a book called The Productive Leadership System, Maximizing Organizational Reliability. And you may have seen uh, one of my articles over the past 13 years in uh, Plant Services Magazine. Uh, those articles are typically related to organization and uh, leadership, primarily for supervisors and mid-level managers. And uh, so I'm just gonna move on. You can go back and check out all those things. Uh, this is what my book looks like. And uh, as you can see, there's uh, a number of the top folks in our industry uh, have read it and uh, have given me quotes. Uh, so. Again, feel free to take your time and read through those at a later date, but um, we're gonna keep moving here. So making process changes permanent, one of the you know preeminent people in our uh, field has been uh, W. Edwards Deming. And there are two quotes that uh, I think are apropos uh, to this presentation. The first, the aim of leadership should be to improve the performance of man and machine, to improve quality, to increase, increase output, and simultaneously to bring pride of workmanship to people. And the second one is that 94% of problems in business are systems driven 
and only 6% are people driven. So I think you'll see how those come into play as we go through this. The first thing I wanted to talk about is culture. So my view of culture, what is culture? To me, culture is what most people do most of the time. What people do are behaviors. And when a person performs a behavior often enough, it becomes a habit. And there's something very specific about a habit that we'll talk about here in a, in a, in a short time. So when most people have the same habits, that's how you produce the culture. And it's important to note that once a habit is, is established, it is permanently stored in long-term memory. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more depth uh, in a little bit here too. So if we look at this pyramid and we start at the bottom, the way that we create habits is we have to start with a short-term memory. And short-term memories come from loading information into our short into the portion of our brain that takes short-term memories. And we can get those by reading, by training, by making observations. Uh, short-term memories though are volatile. They don't last very long unless we do something to consolidate those memories into long-term memories. So long-term memories happen by consolidation of short-term memories. And we'll talk about repetition and pattern hooks as to how that happens, how we consolidate short-term to long-term memories. And then behaviors. People carry out behaviors based on long-term memories, not short-term memories. So that's the reason we want to convert short-term to long-term memories, because that's what our behaviors are based on. And then once we repeat those behaviors often enough, there's a biological thing that happens in our brains when we create a habit. Um, when we're learning something, when it's not yet a habit, we're having to deal with that information uh, in, a, in a portion of our brain called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex consumes a lot of energy while, it's, while we think, while we're trying to um, think our way through a scenario. When it becomes a habit, control of those behaviors shifts to a portion of our brain called the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia basically just runs a routine. You don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. And that's a biological portion of our brain, how we're hardwired. It's a really incredible thing. So when we talk about short-term memories, again, what we want to do is define the right behaviors. When we're thinking about setting up a process or a policy or a procedure, we want to define what the right behaviors are by putting it down in guidance, by telling people what it is that we want them to do. We then introduce those right behaviors. We explain what it is that we are trying to accomplish with that policy plan, process, or procedure. We then need to provide the assets so that people can carry out those right behaviors that we defined. And then we have to provide training to load the information and to begin the consolidation process, that transfer from short-term to long-term memory. So again, remember that short-term memories are temporary. They last from only a few minutes to a few days. And unless something is done to consolidate that short-term memory into a long-term memory, the short-term memory will be lost. I use the example all the time when, uh, when I go golfing. I might meet somebody that I, I didn't know before on the first tee. We introduce each other, uh, ourselves to each other, and we hit our tee shots. And before I get to where I hit my tee shot, um, I've already forgotten the other person's name, right? So that's an example of the volatility of short-term memory. And by the way, what I do now is I write their name on the scorecard. <laughs> as soon as I hear it. So um, I can I can uh, call them by name uh, without having that faux pas. So now when we talk about long-term memories, there are four different methods that we use to consolidate or transfer short-term to long-term memories. The first is spaced repetition. And this is simply the way it sounds. It's just repeating an activity over and over again until it becomes ingrained into our long-term memory. The second and third both include pattern hooks. So the first is engaging multiple senses. Uh, an example of this is when you learned how to drive a car. 
you had uh, an instructor, maybe a parent or uh, an older sibling that was giving you verbal instructions, so you're hearing. You're also hearing things like the engine starting, the engine racing, or um, uh, feeling with your hands on the steering wheel and your feet on the gas accelerator and clutch, right? Your vision, looking at the mirrors, seeing the relative motion of things around you. The way your brain stores information when there are pattern hooks it tends to associate uh, different types of information so it's easier to recall. The third one, uh, leveraging similar experiences, is also a pattern hook. So that might be something like computer-based training or uh, video-based training, right, where you sit in a, a booth, uh, uh, say, uh, pilot training, where you sit in a booth and you see your peripheral vision, everything's encompassed um, by that experience. So it's putting you in a similar experience and you're seeing things um, in a very similar uh, manner. The last one, the fourth one, is witnessing something that's emotionally charged. Um, this could be something like seeing somebody fall off of a scaffolding in a, in a production plant uh, from like 12 feet up down to a concrete floor or witnessing a car crash, something like that. That tends to put it immediately into your long-term memory when there's a significant uh, emotionally charged event. So obviously we don't wanna be uh, using emotionally charged events as training or ways to consolidate memories. So it's really spaced repetition, engaging multiple senses and leveraging similar experiences. So spaced repetition and pattern hooks are the best method and behaviors have to be repeated often enough so that they become habits. And remember when we, I said about habits is really converting your memories, right? And, and you're um, creating behaviors that we don't need to think about anymore. They become second nature. So when a person no longer has to, has to think through each sub behavior, they have established a habit. So behavior instructions shift from the cerebral cortex to the basal ganglia. And this is an evolutionary thing. We wanted to, uh, evolution allows us the size of our cerebral cortex means that we're thinking reasoning beings. And, but that cerebral cortex takes a great deal of brain energy. And so what our biology has done is it gave us this basal ganglia that allows us to kind of export these algorithms or routines. So it frees up our brain to do something else. Um, an example of that is, um, when you drove into work or drove home uh, from work, you'll notice that you don't have to think about how much turn to put on the steering wheel of your car or truck, when to hit the brakes. You don't even think about the route home much, uh, you know, unless there's a detour that you have to make. Um, but as you're driving home, probably you've experienced that you're thinking about something else while you're driving, but your body is still carrying out the functions of driving home. That's an example of those instructions moving from the cerebral cortex to the basal ganglia. Habits are a form of autopilot. Just like I said, it's like driving your car home. Uh, another thing that's very important to understand when we're trying to make, uh, make behaviors stick, we're trying to make changes permanent, is that old habits never get erased. People will revert to the old habit if they believe the old habit is better for them, and if there's a low probability of consequences for reverting to that old habit. So if their supervisor or manager does, is not attentive, they don't see that they're deviating and going back to an old habit, the consequences of reverting to that old habit are low. So that'll be a recurring theme throughout the rest of this, uh, this uh, webinar. So what this means in terms of making changes permanent, we must put in effort to create habits. And once we establish those habits, we must stay attentive and assertive to keep the habit we, that we want repeated. So some key points, the key point here is that behaviors are observable. We can see how people behave. We can see what activities they're doing. And so, because behaviors are observable, we can observe individual behaviors, behaviors of individual leaders, and of their direct reports. 
So if you're a manager, you can observe the behaviors of the supervisors that report to you and the people within that supervisor's work center. What we then have to do is reinforce the behaviors that lead to the right habits. And that means that we have to give positive and corrective feedback. We need to correct the behaviors that don't lead to the right habits. And we have to also give positive feedback, right? So productive leaders have to be consistent in their expectations. They have to be attentive to observe behaviors and they have to be assertive in praising or giving positive feedback for conforming behaviors. And we have to address directly non-conforming behaviors. And here's a productive leadership pet tip is you have to plan on how you will assertively communicate feedback on performance. This is a very hard thing for people to that have not been in leadership positions before. And even for some leaders who have been in leadership positions for a period of time, if they've never learned how to do this properly. When you're trying to give somebody constructive or corrective feedback, it can be very stressful. An image that I like to think about when I think about giving positive and corrective feedback is a bowling alley. So I don't know if you've ever taken uh, your children to a bowling alley but or seen this happen, but parents often ask the bowling alley staff to put bumpers up. It keeps the kids from rolling gutter balls, right? So if you think about the left side bumper as corrective feedback and the right side bumper as positive feedback, that can give you a good mental image on the fact that you need to be giving at least as much positive as negative or corrective feedback. Productive leaders guide behaviors by giving positive and corrective feedback. And positive feedback is letting people know that they're doing things correctly. Don't just assume that they know. Corrective feedback is letting them know when they are not doing something correctly. And if either the left or the right bumper is missing, it's a lot easier to throw gutter balls, right? So if you're not reinforcing the complying behaviors, people don't know, and they may start drifting off of doing the behavior that you're acting, you're asking them to do, the right behaviors. So one of the things I said earlier was that giving uh, corrective feedback uh, can be very stressful. Uh, if you don't have a plan on how to do that. So I'm going to give you a quick lesson on the three-step method and the six-step corrective method. The three-step method, I say you use both for positive and corrective feedback. The three steps are very simple. The first is that you state exactly the behavior that you saw, right? It could be a good behavior or a non-complying behavior. You just want to state what it is that you saw, Explain how that behavior made you feel. I feel good about it because it means we're making progress, or I don't feel good about this because it's not what we're asking you to do. Okay, and then the third step is to ask them to either continue with the good behaviors or stop doing the non complying behaviors. Okay, it's a very simple, straightforward three step process. But again, if you're trying to correct somebody's behavior, have these three steps in mind, even write down what you're gonna say and practice it before you actually say it. And it's also a great thing to use when you're giving positive feedback, telling people they're doing things the right way. Now, when somebody has repeated problems or they're um, uh, simply not looking like they're trying to comply, then you go to the more formal six step corrective method. And this is not for giving positive feedback. It's really just for giving corrective feedback. So again, the first thing is to describe the behavior that was observed. The second is to explain why that observed behavior concerns you and what the con state what the consequences are if that behavior is continued. The third step is the most important. That's where you ask for the other person's point of view. And you be quiet. You let them tell you why they did what they did. They may have had a perfectly good reason that you didn't consider. So this is an extremely important step and it will either build trust or destroy trust. So um, ask for the other person's point of view and be quiet and listen. 
once they're done talking, review or confirm the understanding of what the proper or the right behaviors are that you're expecting of that person. Then ask that person for a commitment to do better. And then the sixth step is to monitor their compliance and let them know when you see improvement. Okay. So we need to be giving positive feedback because it's, it is the most neglected part of making changes permanent. We need to tell people frequently when they're doing things correctly, especially when, when that process or procedure is first being put into place, but we need to do it all throughout the life of that process or procedure. Giving corrective feedback is stressful. So use these methods to have a game plan for the interaction uh, so that you can reduce your stress level. It's a lot easier to think when you're not stressed. So let's diagnose, diagnose a few breakdowns that could lead to uh, change failure. Um, when I talk about diagnosing breakdowns, the best way uh, that I've come up with are these two models, the organizational reliability model and the productive leadership model. So first let's talk a bit about accountability. So just to be clear, when I talk about accountability, I'm talking about ultimate responsibility. This is required or expected to justify your own actions or decisions and the actions and decisions of those who you have delegated responsibility to. In other words, when you delegate, you cannot give up your accountability. So accountability cannot be delegated. Responsibility is to have control and authority over something or someone and the duty of taking care of it or them. Responsibility can be delegated. So I can be responsible, I'm sorry, I can be accountable for my work center's uh, budget, but I can delegate responsibility to somebody else to handle the day-to-day -day activities of managing the budget. I still am accountable for it, right? So hopefully you can see that, that difference. So what we need is an accountability model that applies to each level of leadership. So this is the organizational reliability model. And this model illustrates how accountability is assigned at each organizational level. So what happens on the top half of this model is a thing called, this is the uh, proactive improvement realm. So this is where the senior person is accountable to establish and update mission, vision, values, and objectives, the direction for that uh, for that work center. The senior persons are accountable to assess, define, authorize, and implement new requirements and to update existing requirements. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. The bottom half of the model is the control and stability realm. In the control and stability realm, the subordinate person or the junior person across this leadership level is accountable for executing current requirements. And when I say requirements, I'm talking about guidance and assets. That subordinate person is also accountable to communicate strengths and weaknesses to the senior person. So let's talk a little bit more depth about this model. So if I'm looking at the proactive improvement realm, we look at assess that uh, dark green uh, circle to the left in the top. This is the activities to identify, sort, filter, and prioritize strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as I mentioned earlier, strengths and weaknesses come from internal processes. Opportunities and threats come from outside of your uh, sphere of influence. Define are the activities to collect information, analyze, and determine best solutions. And authorize is the formal decision to go forward with the best solutions. Now you'll notice that within the assess and define are uh, enclosed in a circle that indicates that it is uh, identified requirements. Okay, so when we move from uh, when we move from define to implement, that signifies that the requirements are now authorized. And as they move out of that that uh, lighter green circle into implement. And when we talk about implement, this includes the activities to put the solution into practice, 
provide guidance, assets to train, to commission, and to drive it to a common practice. So the significance here is that that senior person remains accountable until that process or that procedure or um, whatever it is we're trying to establish until it becomes common practice. So if we look at now the control and stability realm, that's the bottom half of the model. Guidance are the current policies, plans, processes, procedures, and measures. And assets are the current resources provided to enable guidance to be carried out. So just like in the upper half of the model, there's that medium uh, colored green circle that encompasses guidance and assets. And guidance and assets are enclosed in that circle indicating that they are current requirements. And when I say current, I mean that current guidance and current assets constrain the achievable level of performance that a subordinate can be held accountable to achieve. And so when I talk about current guidance and current assets, it means that whatever was provided to me by the senior person, uh, let's say for instance, I'm a supervisor of a work center and I'm the subordinate or the junior person uh, accountable to carry out current guidance with current assets. If somehow I have 10 persons in my work center, that's what I'm authorized to have, but three of them are gone. One retired and two of them took other jobs. I now have seven people, but I have guidance. I have an expectation that I'm going to carry out guidance that requires 10 people. I can't be held accountable to do something that I don't have the assets to do. So there are methods on how to influence upwards to uh, address that. But it starts with the execution. So execution is the application of productive leadership or skills and expertise to carry out current guidance with current assets. So remember I said that this model applies across each level of leadership. So at each level of leadership, there's a senior person and a junior person. So organizational culture change requires that these levels be linked, that accountabilities be linked across all involved levels of leadership. So at the top level at a plant, for instance, you have a plant manager would be the senior person and the department managers would be the junior persons at that leadership level. But if we drop down a level, that department manager is now the senior person to assistant managers that report to that department manager, and so on. The assistant manager is senior to supervisors, and supervisors are senior to their team members. So at each level, the senior person is accountable to provide direction and guidance and the assets required to carry it out. And the junior person is accountable to execute current guidance with current assets and to notify the senior person when they don't have what they need. So each leader is accountable, get the right behaviors from their direct reports. And using this model, it's easy to identify accountability problems. So if there's a top-down um, program that we're trying to put into place, you can figure out where the accountabilities are and where the problems are in getting that, that uh, message or that program to penetrate the organization. So now let's talk about the productive leadership model. This is the model that defines individual leadership capabilities. So we've assigned accountabilities. Now we need individual leadership capabilities of the individual leaders. So the way that we de describe this model is that a leader provided with direction and requirements, applying leadership roles, attributes, and skills through personal and position power, influencing others towards achieving goals. I know it's pretty long-winded, but when we look at this model, we talk about direction and direction is mission, vision, values, and objectives. So a leader at any level needs to know what is the, uh, what is the direction that we're trying to go. They also need guidance and assets. They need to know what the requirements are. So from those two direction and uh, requirements, a leader can, can have what they need, the structure that they need to be able to perform. 
these light blue boxes or shapes are the leader, leadership roles, leadership attributes, leadership skills, sources of power, influencing others and setting goals. And these are the means that that leader executes. Can we talk first about the leader? Uh, this is a great quote that I came across years ago uh, by a gentleman named Gordon, uh, Harry Gordon Selfridge. He was, uh, ran a uh, uh, department store in England, uh, a series of department stores. And he said, the boss drives people, the leader coaches them. The boss depends on authority, the leader on goodwill. The boss inspires fear, the leader inspires enthusiasm. The boss says I, the leader says we. The boss fixes the blame for the breakdown, the leader fixes the breakdown. The boss says go, the leader says let's go. So with that, oops, excuse me, with that general uh, quote or that overview quote um, in mind, what I say is that the leaders must want to be a leader. They must want to be in that leadership position. They must want accountability. They want to, they must want to be accountable. And they should have a personal mission, vision, values, and objectives that are aligned with the current and future leadership positions. Now, if we look next to leader in a, uh, the upper right corner uh, where the model is, if you look next to the leader, there's roles, attributes, and skills. So there are five of each of those. So the five leadership roles and roles are where a leader applies their time. And the five roles are expert technician, manager administrator, coach, systems thinker, and visionary. And these are the focus areas that a leader is working in during any part of the day. Leaders at every level can be working in any of these five roles when acting as a leader. Productive leaders allocate the appropriate amount of time to each of these focus areas. And sometimes a leader may not be fulfilling any of these leadership roles. And that could be if they're doing uh, self-development. Maybe they're trying to learn something about, uh, you know, they're, they're anticipating being promoted. So they're trying to learn something about that new position. Maybe they're trying to get better at how to, uh, uh, how to do reliability engineering or how to manage a budget. So they can be working on themselves and that sort of thing would be another category. But for the periods of time that they're working in a leadership role, it's one of those five. Uh, an expert technician is what that sounds like, is you know being an expert in your field. Uh, but most leaders should be doing very little time as expert technician. The idea here is that somebody gave you the opportunity to perform uh, at some point in the past. So it's your turn now to give somebody else the opportunity. So put down the tools, let somebody else have the opportunity to show what they can do. Manager, administrator, most leaders should be spending 30 or 40% of their time at least as a manager administrator. And that's to remove barriers that keep your your team from working as effectively as they can. Coach is how you help to develop others, how you um, try to bring people along either technically or leadership wise. Systems thinker, that's working on your internal processes and procedures, trying to make them better. And visionary is when you're looking at those opportunities and threats from outside of your area of responsibility, things that may impact your area of responsibility downstream. So if we move along next to the five leadership attributes, and when I talk about roles, attributes, and skills, anybody can learn these things. Um, there, there's often our leaders born or made. I'm in the camp 100% that leaders are made. They can learn because of the way our brains function. So when I talk about leadership attributes now, these are things that you can learn to do. You can learn to be consistent. You can learn to be attentive, respectful, motivating, and assertive. And so these are the attributes or characteristics that a productive leader exhibits. These attributes set the conditions for team members to trust in and respect their leader. And then productive leaders show appreciation and respect for their team members through these attributes. And a way to help, hopefully help you remember this is those first letters spell karma with a C. 
Um, I know karma spelt with a K. Um, I'm probably going to regret this. You know, I'll, it'll come back to me somehow, right? <laughs> now, if we move on to the leadership skills, these are the typical skills that you learn in a leadership course, right? Time management, communication, empowerment, giving and receiving feedback, and managing conflict. And, and I'm hoping that you're getting the idea here that uh, if you attend a leadership training course and the only thing they're teaching are these leadership skills, then you're not getting the totality of the leadership capability and the aspects that you need to have to be a productive leader. So time management is, you know, making time for the important things. Um, Time management allows you then to apply your time to those leadership roles that we talked about. Communication is how you treat people respectfully and make sure that you're heard and that you're hearing other people. It includes things like body language and, and vocal tone and being, being able to pick up on nuances with other people's communication and being aware of you know, your body language and gestures and things that may influence how other people are receiving your message. Empowerment is delegation. How do I develop people? How do I delegate work to them to improve them? That's, that's important for the coaching role. Giving and receiving feedback is making sure that we are communicating, remember the positive and corrective feedback. Uh, but we're also listening. We want other people to give us positive and corrective feedback when there's things that we as a leader are doing that are not correct. And then managing conflict is making sure that we are uh, not letting things get out of control. We're using the appropriate methods to diffuse situations and to get to um, good resolution when there are conflicts. So these are the most important skills that a productive leader needs to know. Um, these skills provide the ability to allocate the right amount of time to leadership roles to enable karma. Remember, consistent, attentive, respectful, motivational, and assertive. And, uh, and to enable these interactions with others. And then this is a productive leader's toolkit. It enables them to establish and maintain the right behaviors, habits, and culture. So now, if you look at the model uh, in the upper right corner, the personal power and position power, uh, they kind of straddle that center set of shapes. We all, as leaders, need to know what our sources of power are. And there's two sources of power uh, coming from, I'm sorry, there are two bases of power and seven sources of power. The power bases are in the type column. So there's position and personal, and there are a couple that are hybrids of position and personal. So position power is power that's delegated down to you by virtue of your job title. That's simply uh, power that's delegated down through the organizational chain. There's coercive power, reward power, and legitimate. Coercive is the ability to impose sanctions or punishment to gain compliance. Reward is the ability to provide rewards or recognition to gain compliance. And legitimate power is just the right to influence others' activities just by the nature of your job title or position. The two personal power uh, sources, expert and referent, expert is expecting, uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, it is the respect, it's gaining the respect from others based on your skills, expertise, or experience. And referent power is basically positive personal traits and integrity, how you treat other people. And uh, personal power is power not given to you by virtue of your position. It's given to you by other people that allow themselves to be influenced by you by the way that you interact with people. And so we want to primarily be dealing with personal power when we're interacting with people. And then information and connection power are hybrids. That's being in possession of or having access to valuable information or having access to others who have position or personal power. And um, as I said, productive leaders use position power sparingly, but they do use position power when it's appropriate. And sometimes there's a job that just has to get done. Nobody wants to do it. Well, sometimes we just have to use uh, position power to drive those, those changes or those activities. But, but there's another thing here about uh, when, you are, uh, when you originally get to a position, 
right? You might not know your team members, they may not know you. So when you get into that position, that's where you need position power to be delegated to you to start with. You then need to use that position power properly. When you use that properly, then you start gaining personal power, power that's given to you by others, by how you, how you act, how you do things. Then you can go to a proper balance between position and personal power. And when you get that proper balance, you get even more position and personal power. But the opposite is also true. If you get to a new position and you're delegated uh, position power, but then you don't use that position power properly, then others will withhold personal power from you. That creates an imbalance between personal and position power, and that ultimately leads to a decrease in position and personal power. So we want to be really careful of that. So leaders are initially provided position power. How they utilize that initial personal uh, position power determines how much additional power they'll be given. So that's a great reason why people need to know about power, sources of power. So now also influencing others, this is the next step out on the model. When we're applying productive leadership roles, attribute skills, and sources of power to shape behaviors, to get the right habits and the right culture. So the first thing is we wanna be able to build trust. To be able to influence others, we need to build trust. And trust means having confidence in another person's thoughts and actions. So be trustworthy and consistent in everything that you do. Remember, consistent was the first in the KARMA acronym. Be aware of the thoughts and feelings of others. The second thing is to understand the needs and motivation models that rule human behavior, right? So everybody probably has heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But there are others, things like uh, Hertzberg's motivator hygiene theory and McClellan's needs theories. So study these things. Uh, understand how people are motivated and what types of things you can do to increase motivation. And therefore, how do you influence people? And then understand some things about group dynamics, how groups are formed and how they function. There's things called group norms, which are the agreed upon ways that members within the group act. There's a thing called triads, and this, this is really where the importance of cohesion throughout the chain of command. There shouldn't be any daylight between a supervisor and a manager. Um, triads actually are a, uh, a stable uh, form where two parties are closely tied and an outlier is a third, uh, third uh, entity that is not within the tight group. So understanding how triads work is, is really important. Uh, the idea of capability versus motivation, right? So capability problems are when somebody doesn't have the skills, the tools, the knowledge, um, the, the uh, resources to be able to carry out a task or a behavior. Motivation problems are the, the uh, nice way to say somebody has got an attitude problem. But what we have to do is always assume that the problems are capability problems because a lot of um, problems that appear to be motivation problems really have the roots and capability. It could be that you have a colorblind electrician, or it could be that um, somebody is dyslexic and they have a hard time entering information into a CMMS, right? So understand your folks. This is another reason why uh, it's so important to have an appropriate span of control so that a leader gets to know their people. Uh, the next thing is to deal with motivation problems, not because of the individual that's a poor performer, we want to deal with that motivation problem because we want to support everyone else that's doing what they're supposed to be doing and performing well. And that's a, a nuance that a lot of um, new leaders don't quite understand sometimes. So we want to be trustworthy so that when there are difficulties, your team members will give you the benefit of the doubt. You want to understand human nature, learn the needs, motivations, and behaviors of individuals and groups. And the last piece of the model is uh, setting goals. And you've probably heard the acronym SMART for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So what precisely do you want to achieve? The more specific you can be, the greater chance that you'll achieve that specific goal. Measurable, we want quantitative, not qualitative. We don't want to say we want to get better. We want to say we want to have a 10% improvement in this activity. 
right? Um, we want to be able to identify the specific observable parameters when the goal is achieved. Attainable, you know, don't make people stretch too far. It's, it's, you know, we need to make sure that what we're asking them to do is doable. The goal shouldn't discourage team members. It should be possible, even if it's a little bit difficult. And then relevant, why do you want to reach this goal? What's the objective behind the goal, right? So the direction of the organization or that group, that's where we're trying to head to. This is a goal that leads in that direction. And, you know, what will we see when that goal is really achieved? And then timely, when should it be achieved? And it depends on the nature of the goal that you're setting up, right? So, but just recall that without a time frame, there's no pressure to accomplish the goal. So that's the um, productive leadership model in a nutshell. And so now I'm going to uh, go through a quick summary and then we'll have time for a few questions. So summary, remember culture is what most people do most of the time. What people do are behaviors. Behaviors are based on long-term memories. And behaviors repeated often enough become habits. Remember, when the habit occurs, it shifts right from our cerebral cortex to our basal ganglia. It becomes a, an automated response. So when people have the same habits, when most of the people have the same habits, that's how you form the culture. Habits are the key to making changes permanent. In order to make the habits correct, we have to load the right information into short-term memory. Then we need to use space repetition or pattern hooks to consolidate those memories. And remember that behaviors are observable. So we can tell if people revert to previous habits. We can tell if people are doing the procedures and processes the right way or if we need to correct them. We need to provide positive and corrective feedback until the behaviors become habits. And remember what I said that uh, the, the most uh, frequently, um, the, the biggest gap is in not giving enough positive feedback, right? And corrective feedback, we tend to give people corrective feedback all the time, but we tend to shortchange the positive feedback. Also, leaders have to be accountable. At each leadership level, the senior person provides direction and requirements, and the junior person executes current requirements and identifies strengths and weaknesses. Leadership skills are only a fraction of the, what productive leaders need. So leadership capability should include the fact that a leader should have the desire to be in a leadership position. They should have the desire to be accountable and they should have their own set of personal mission, vision, values, and objectives. And they should learn and apply leadership roles, leadership attributes, leadership skills, personal and position power. They should know the things that they need to know about influencing others and they should know how to set goals properly. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Heather and uh, see if there are any questions. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for taking us through that. Really, really interesting and, and deep dive covered a lot of information. So I really appreciate you putting that together and, and walking us through. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Must have been so clear. So if there are any questions out there in the live audience, please feel free to submit them. Um, I have a question, possibly two of my own. Um, yeah. One of, one of which is uh, this idea of giving good feedback is something that um, I hear and I work on a lot in my own professional life. Yep. Um, what is maybe an example of some of the best feedback, either structurally or had the most impact um, that you've kind of ever received or seen exchanged um, in your well, career? Yeah, so um, those models, the three step and the six step, uh, that's, and I'll tell you, those came from my days in the Coast Guard. That's how they taught us. And when you think about uh, people that enter the military, you get people from 17 years old, uh, 18, 19, 20 year olds that come into the service from a variety of backgrounds. And in the military services, everything is constantly uh, trying to prepare you for higher responsibility. And so you get excellent mentorship, you get excellent training, 
Um, every year, a third of the people you work for, a third of the people that are your peers, and a third of the people that report to you leave. They get orders to go to some other um, some other unit. And you get a new batch of people that you see. And so you see all these different styles and um, ways that people lead and ways that people follow, right? Because that's the other half of the equation. And so uh, in the service, that's where I learned the three-step and the six-step. It's very simple to apply. Um, and it, the, the biggest part about that, Heather, is if you're, um, if you're somebody who has to give somebody corrective feedback, so somebody's not complying or not doing something that we're expecting them to do, the way that our bodies are set up is that when we start getting a level of stress, um, it makes it harder to think. Um, our, our vision narrows down. Uh, you get tense, your, your heart rate goes up, right? You might start sweating. Those are physiological responses to stress that occurs in our brain. And so when you put together, and it, you know, if you have a different method of doing a three-step or a six-step process, that's fine. The idea is to have a process or procedure that you can think through before you have to actually go and have that conversation because that lowers your stress level because you know exactly what you want to say, right? Um, in the book, I go into a lot of detail about, uh, you know, when you actually do this, uh, sometimes the person that you're counseling will start throwing up all kinds of other, yeah, but this and yeah, but that, and they're, they're not taking responsibility for their action. Um, so there's ways in the book that I talk about how you deflect that for the time being, deal with the issue at hand, and then you can circle back and deal with these other issues, um, which is, again, why step three in the six step process is so important, right? You need to be quiet and listen to their side of it. Um, oftentimes, people did something for the right reason, but it might be dead wrong, right? Um, so you don't want to, um, you don't want to, uh, you know, browbeat somebody or, or kill them over something that's not really um, appropriate to do, right? Um, could be they didn't have the right tool or they didn't have um, the materials that they needed. So they made do figuring, they figured that it was better to get the machine up and running than it was to do the job right. Well, that's not what we want, right? We want precision maintenance, uh, but you get the idea. Awesome. Um, I see we have someone typing in the chat. Thank you for your response, by the way. That's really helpful and, and mm -hmm. adds a lot of color. Like I said, that's something that I, I think about a lot and focus on in my own work. So it's it's interesting to hear and, and continue developing um, that skill myself. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's practice, right? Um, the more you do it, the more easy it becomes and the less stressful it becomes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I would say this too, Heather, that the two most difficult things for a new leader to learn, this is whether you were a tradesman uh, going into a supervisor role, or maybe you were an engineer or a finance person that's going into a management role, right? The two most difficult things uh, in that transition is number one, to put down the tools, right? To stop being the expert technician. And the second thing is, how do you uh, correct somebody that used to be your peer, right? It's an uncomfortable thing. Uh, but we deal with both of those situations in the in the book. So, awesome. Um, well, the the person typing was just a, a shout out, a thank you for the the knowledgeable information. Um, so I think uh, if if there's no more questions, I see someone else typing, so I'm trying to stall a little bit as well. Um, but if there's nothing else coming in, um, we can give everyone five minutes back in their day. And okay. um, yeah. Oh, you said you uh, had a second question. Um, oh, we have a question from the audience. My my second question is more just about um, the the followers' contribution to making process change permanent. Aside from you know being in the right mindset for change, um, mm -hmm. but we have one from the audience. I think might be a little bit better for the, the last few minutes we have here, and then we can take my question offline as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so a question from Amal just came in, says, could you provide us with a KPI to measure if the process change has become permanent? How do you measure success there? Yeah, so um, I'll give you an example. So, I mean, it really depends on what process or procedure you're trying to do, right? But uh, an example of how you could set up a KPI uh, was, let's say uh, we had been putting in a work management process and there are 
two different types of measures that I think about, right? So there are process measures and there are um, uh, measures that are more difficult. Uh, they're behavior measures uh, is what I call them, right? So a process measure would be, uh, let's say that uh, your work management process, you have um, codes that are being put in so you, you can track how long it takes, say, for a planner to look at the highest priority job plans, right, and move them from, uh, from the backlog through planning into ready to schedule. Well, that is something that through the use of timestamps and, and codes, you can get it uh, put into place so that you can then track those measures, right? So are we getting shorter turnaround time or longer turnaround time? And you can see how those happen within the process. The more difficult ones are the things that I call behavior measures. So behavior measures, say in that uh, in a related scenario, let's say that when we're asking the trades to close out a work order, and within that closed work order, there might be five or six pieces of information that we are expecting that uh, tradesmen to put into the closed out work order um, uh, or completed work order. Well, if those are text fields, then we can't really, you know, free text fields, we can't really uh, say whether they were definitely being done or not. But what we could do is, let's say there's 500 work orders that are closed during the week. Um, as a supervisor, I could go in and pick maybe 30 of them at random. Um, I'm not going to look at all 500. There's just not enough hours in the day. But I might take a random sample of 30 of them and see whether each of those five elements are being closed out properly, right? Or that information is being added to the work order. And if I look at those 30, I take a percentage. What percentage of them are being done correctly and which ones aren't, right? So I can convert a behavior uh, into a metric that way. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for you to do that. Now, I would be doing that when I first put that work management process into place. I would be doing that weekly, initially, until you start seeing 100% compliance. Once you get 100% compliance for several weeks, now you could back off and do it every other week or maybe once a month. But the idea is that you never stop looking at it. Because remember what I said, if you, uh, memories, uh, habits are burned into our memory. So if somebody perceives it's better to do the old habit and there's a low consequence of being caught or, or you know, low consequences of uh, reverting, then they will revert. That's what it's like uh, energy, right? Energy always goes from a high energy state to a low energy state. So unless you put energy back in and that energy is the leader being attentive and assertive, unless you're doing that periodically, um, the energy level goes down and people will revert. And that's the idea behind giving positive and corrective feedback. So Amal, I hope that answered your question. I thought that was great. Um, interesting to convert behaviors to metrics like that. Um, I'm not sure if I've heard such a clear explanation of it. So really awesome um, to hear. Yeah, and, I, and I, you know, one of the other things, you, you know, in uh, Lean, there's a thing called chalk circles. Joe mm -hmm. Kuhn uh, talks about this all the time on Lean Driven Reliability Podcast. Chalk circles, just go out in the field and stand there and watch how things are happening. Uh, the fact that you're out there looking, you're going to see things that are uh, maybe not compliant or things that are compliant and be able to give that positive feedback. Yeah, I think it, it means a lot when you're there even making the effort to give that kind of feedback as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I, when I was on a ship, I, I was a chief engineer on a ship. When I was brand new, the captain told me, hey, it's your engine room. You know, do what you need to do. I won't bug you. And I said, no, sir, I want you in the engine room. I want you to periodically walk through there to see the guys see you doing to see you seeing them do good. Right. So uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful thing. Really awesome. Well, I appreciate you sharing um, all of that information, making us all better leaders and, and better understanding of how to kind of you know, implement these kinds of process changes in a successful and, and a long lasting way. Um, I think we will leave it there. That is all of the questions we received in and my question you answered. So I appreciate that uh, okay. to wrap our session up. And I would just uh, ask folks to consider buying my book. And uh, there's a lot of information that's in there. And uh, if you like that, I'm happy to come out and do workshops and uh, 
and speaking engagements. So uh, my contact information is, is on the slide. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much again for the time and I hope you have an awesome rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, you too. Thanks, bye-bye.